Happy Monday, everybody. How's it going? Fine, thank you. It's going well. Welcome, Oli. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thanks for, for having me uh, on the Monday morning data chat. Yeah, stoked to have you here. So, uh, yeah, for people who don't know who you are, uh, do you want to give a quick intro? Yeah, of course. Um, so, my name is uh, Ole Olesen Benjur. I uh, live in, uh, in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, and I'm an enterprise architect at the uh, GN Store Nord. GN stands for Great North, uh, and Store Nord is uh, is Danish for Great North. Uh, yeah, so I'm basically I'm an enterprise architect. I focus a lot on data. Um, I am to design a data transformation program at GN Store Nord, um, focusing a lot on scalable data management, data mesh, uh, whatever you want to call that. Interesting. And besides that, I'm um, I'm writing a book on data catalogs. Uh, I've been working with data catalogs for quite a while as a as a, as a as a component that I've been uh, implementing in several companies, and that I also think are um, uh, I think it's a very important tool. And so I decided to try to, to write a book about that, and I suggested a manuscript to to Aureli just uh, I think close to a year ago now, and uh, they accept the, the proposal, and I saw I've been writing the book, and I'm. I'm wrapping up now. It's uh, the deadline for the development editing is uh, de December 16th. After that, there'll be a couple of months of uh, proofreading and setting up like all the, the diagrams and so on. And, and then finally, um, the book will be out uh, for sale uh, next year. Now, you yeah. also wrote a dissertation, right? For you have a PhD in library sciences. Am I getting this right? Yeah, yeah, that is right. That is right. Uh, so, so um, I have a, a PhD in, in library and information science. It goes back a while. Um, I finished, uh, geez, uh, seven years ago now from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, I also taught. I lectured there for a couple of uh, years while moving to back into industry. I was at a couple of years, but between my master's and my PhD, I was out in, a, in a, an industry working for a pharmaceutical company. But yeah, I did a PhD in, a, in library information science. I, I focused on, um, I had a, yeah, to, to, to keep it short, right? I, I had a, a medium theoretical take on, um, on library information science and technology. So, so medium theory is really this, Maybe you know this catchphrase from Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message, but medium theory mm, yep. is very, very much into like studying what particular media does for communication and human behavior. And um, so my PhD was about trying to find some patterns of similarities between the way you store text, retrieve uh, text, search in text prior to, to the printing press. So back way back from medieval times antiquity and then the way digital text is stored and searching and so forth so i was actually capable of of finding uh, exact uh, algorithms um back in the mnemonic techniques that the uh, scholars used back then it was pretty cool uh not a lot of people got that phd <laughs> Uh, but um, I guess the topic is was rather narrow. But but like topic of search, uh, how you store uh, organized data at a conceptual level, uh, how you search it uh, throughout history, and definitely with digital technologies, is something that has been on my mind uh, pretty much all my, all of my work life. So it's also something that I've worked with in in uh, in the pharmaceutical sector. So so Joe, prior to the meeting, when we when we talked a little bit about uh, the topics for, for today, right? I, I talked about, uh, you have this, this wonderful distinction in your book uh, about hot and cold data in the mm. book, uh, Fundamentals of Data Engineering, right? I think that's, uh, that's just a wonderful way to put it. And uh, hot data being something that is used actively a lot, that's very active, and cold data is something that's very static, uh, and perhaps if it isn't even touched. And so, and so I grew up in the in the world of cold data, cold cold data. That's my uh, <laughs> like fossilized data. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it, as as co as cold as it gets, right? That's that that was where I uh, was raised, and um, 
And, and that has given me a lot of principles, a lot of ideas um, about how to organize data in a very, very long-term perspective. Because the ideas with cold data, of course, is that you can store something and that you can retrieve it hundreds of years from now in, in national archives and in, in very regulated companies. It's perhaps something like 50, 60, 70 years, but that's also a very long time span, right? And so... Um, and this way of structuring knowledge is something that I have, um, yeah, that I've used uh, when I approach this technology that the data catalog is. Um, and so that's what I that's what I discuss in my book. I discuss how you organize knowledge, data, and data catalogs so that you can search it again. That's pretty much the message of my book. Like how you organize data that defines how you can search it in a lot of. Uh, at a lot of levels, right? Conceptually, technically, and so on. It's really interesting. Um, I've been seeing more and more, uh, uh, I guess, questions with data engineers, analytics engineers, data scientists, analysts about conceptual uh, modeling. I think this is something that, like a lot of practices uh, in data, sort of go through phases, it seems, where uh, um, people are acutely aware of things like conceptual um, you know, uh, conceptually describing data and modeling it. And then it, um, I think it kind of fell by the wayside for um, a bit. And now it seems to be, uh, there's more interest in this. Uh, I mean, given your, your background, I, I would think you have a very unique perspective um, or maybe a different perspective on conceptual, uh, conceptualizing data, maybe. Um, what are what are some of the common themes that you've seen throughout your career? Because I mean, you started out in, um, information systems, library science, and then you went into to data as a profession. So it's not a typical path, especially studying uh, medieval, um, you know, uh, data and so forth. So uh, what, are there any common themes that you've seen? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, you're right that I, I mean, I think that to be fair, library information science is actually pretty tech, but it's just tech in a way that's not normally associated with how the data community works with tech. Um, so throughout uh, my career, I taught uh, courses on organizing data and searching data in, uh, in various um, reference databases. Um, like lecture that those kind of courses at the University of Copenhagen. Um, but it is right that I have approached uh, the field of data coming from a more, you can say, uh, relatively technical uh, rooted uh, uh, discipline uh, of the humanities. Um, library information science sits in this weird place between being very dependent on certain technologies, certain formats even, and, um, and some, some disciplines, some methodologies that are purely uh, purely into the humanities, if you take a look at them, like they're philosophical, uh, it's very important to have an understanding of uh, linguistics and so on. So, so yeah, that that is my um, that is my background, and that has shaped me, and that is the way I have approached um, uh, the data uh, space. You can say, I think that one of the key Takeaways, I guess that was your question, uh, Joe. One of the key takeaways for me, like entering more into the data space over the course of several years, right? Was that, so one of the things I think was important, I've seen a lot of different things that I, I found weird or possible to, to improve and so on. But, but one of the things that I see currently is the discussion of domains. It's something that I have actually already discussed and put out, I think I've posted about it also, but, but I've also talked about it on, on various uh, shows. But the way we understand domains in, in the data community is very much defined by uh, Eric Evans' uh, book, book uh, Domain Driven Design. And that is a super cool book. <laughs> I would recommend it to everyone that I that was curious about uh, domain-driven design, but but in terms of understanding domains, there's this 
there's this catch with domain-driven design. And it's the fact that, of course, domain-driven design wasn't intended for data. It was intended for designing software, right? So when we applied for data, the way we depict domains uh, mirrors the processes that are taking place uh, inside a specific uh, software or between soft or between IT systems. Uh, so that is how uh, domain-driven design uh, proposes to model domains and data that flows between domains and subdomains and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to structure data at, a, at the metadata level so that it is browsable and logical, uh, relying on how data flows through domains and subdomains creates a rather mesmerizing structure. It's quite difficult to get a hold of like the overall structure of, of your domains and subdomains. Actually, if you were to depict that in the data catalog, that would be data lineage. I mean, it would be some kind of data lineage, right? And so if you want to have an overview of domains, library information science, this is going to be a long answer. I'm uh, just realizing this is a very, very long answer, Joe. But, but um, so if you want to have like domains from information science, uh, you can define it. You can define it in a different way because the, the information science has its own way of understanding domains. It's called a domain analysis. It's a, it's a, it's a discipline uh, completely that evolved completely in parallel with domain-driven design. And it was a little earlier, but there was no connection to domain-driven design. It's just a completely parallel way of studying domains. And it has nothing to do with software. The cool thing about it is that it's it's purely conceptual. So method methodologically, what you do is that you identify a group of people, you study how they communicate, you study their terminology, and you study their purpose of, um, of uh, yeah, you, it's a their epistemological purpose. But but to be a little less academic, you study what they wanna what what knowledge they want to obtain. What do they actually want to know? So that methodology is something that allows you to depict domains in a structure that does not like put data into the structure where it has to flow between domains. Right. And just, just a nice way to get an overview of, of data in, a, in domains. I think an overlapping concept you had in your book too was the, the idea that um, knowledge is both deep and wide. Right. And so yeah, it, it's yeah. it's not just about specifically a, a software driven domain, but um, based upon the knowledge of the group, there's 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 a sense of what it was an intention. I think it was with a uh, with an S and then it was uh, something else. I think it was. But um, I thought that was a very interesting um, concept. I've been actually in the middle of um, uh, studying data modeling from the perspective of like, team topologies, for example, and, and you, know, um, you know, and quote domains. And I find it's a uh, interesting rabbit hole to go down. For, for precisely the reasons that you said it's not um there's there's the obvious answer of you should just apply um, domain driven design to everything i think that that's a fairly acceptable solution but it, it's not a complete answer like i think what you explained in your book actually filled in the gap mentally for me because i was looking at it thinking well okay um but applications are meant to uh, achieve um you know a particular goal uh, data is one of these things where it's a bit more slippery, right? Because it conceptually, it defines things that are um, both inside and outside the bounds of the domain. Therefore, um, you, you can't draw neat lines around it always. So, it, and to me, there's kind of a, a task-oriented issue here. So in other words, if I'm soft, a software developer and I'm working on a microservice, then I'm thinking in terms of just like one task that that microservice does. And that's how I slice my domains is based on tasks. Versus analytics, just like Joe said, you need to pull in knowledge from all these different areas based on what question you're trying to answer. I don't know, like maybe you can give a concrete example of like so, some how, how you would slice domains on the software side versus how you do it on the cataloging side for analytics. Uh, yeah, I can I can uh, I can deliver like a high level answer to that. I think perfect. <laughs> um, uh, so so the 
the main difference, if we consider something like a data mesh, the main difference between the actual data layer and the metadata layer is that for the data layer itself, it's automatically structured in domains and subdomains that are interlinked uh, in however you want to construct your mesh, right? So there's no, there's no escape from, uh, from a domain structure that is intermingled in a way that can seem difficult to, to, to untangle. But at the metadata level, what Jamar calls the experience layer, right? There you can, there I propose that you structure the overview of your domains in a different way. Simply provide a logical um, structure of capabilities, high level capabilities that each have sub capabilities that represent specific domains. And how those sub capabilities, uh, subdomains and, and higher level domains are connected uh, in the actual data layer, that's a different story. But that would be my distinction. So, so high level, I would distinguish between the data layer itself and the metadata layer, because I can see it's actually something that both Jemark and um, also Pete Hans Springhoff, the author of uh, Data Management at Scale, mm. they've been discussing it a lot. That it's they ad they admit both of them that it's quite difficult to depict domains like at a, at a high level, and I think that's because uh, so far these theories have have. Uh, resolved only to domain-driven design, but mm -hmm. it's not a necessity at the metadata level. So you can design that experience layer however you want. It's independent of what is going on in the, in the mesh, for example. Does that That's make great. any sense, Matt? No. That's yeah. nodding. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I'll, I'll also go read your book more than once to get a deeper understanding and have more questions. <laughs> Do you want to take some questions from the audience here? A lot of questions are already dropping, and I think uh, it'd be good to um, get to these. Let's back up here, actually. We, we're talking about data catalogs. I, I think we actually need to define what is the data catalog. And this kind of goes into uh, uh, Tomek's question here. Um, he says uh, he's quite new to the data catalog concept, so it may be obvious. But uh, who, who... first answer my question, what is the data catalog? And then answer his question, who is the data log um, relevant for, and how does it generate value? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very fair. And of course, we should we should start by defining a, a data catalog. So a data catalog, the way I define it, is that <clears throat> it's an inventory of all the data in your company, but at a, at a metadata level. So you can see all the types of data that are uh, that resides in your various uh, IT systems, but um, but at a metadata level only. That's pretty much the main function of a data catalog. And that's pretty much it. So nothing more, nothing less. It's a pretty simple tool. Uh, and I argue that the main capability of a data catalog is to function as a search engine for the data in your, catalog, for the, uh, data in your company. Um, now, given the topic of today's talk, the future of data catalogs, I think we should remember to get back to the future of data catalogs also, Ooh. but, but, uh, but definitely I think the definition is, is very simple. It's an overview of the data in your company and that data can be, that overview can be created, um, using various technologies. Basically you can do push or pull or a combination of push and pull. And that is, so push would be streaming based technologies, whereas pull would be crawlers, uh, and you can use uh, a combination of those as well and to, uh, to extract uh, metadata from your IT systems and expose it in a central repository uh, for everyone to browse. And so I think, I think just continuing with the next question, what, what is, what's the benefits of, uh, of that was something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, who's it relevant for and uh, how does it generate value? Yep. Yeah, so so a data catalog is something that um, can be used for many things and at various uh, scales. Um, I would argue that it is... Uh, I would advise only to have one data catalog for a company. 
uh, because it is not a very complex tool. And unlike a data warehouse or a data lake, a data catalog is not a monolith. It is not something that you would consider a bottleneck in, <clears throat> in for example, an, in a data engineering context. Um, so the, the benefit of having only one data catalog is that you can, is that you can browse all the data in your company at a metadata level. It shouldn't be something that was only administered by a central team. Um, it should be supported by a central function, but it should definitely be useful um, at a contributor level by the entire business. And so what's the benefit of having a data catalog? Well, uh, there are multiple dimensions of that. One dimension is the data governance uh, dimension. You would want to have an overview of all the personal sensitive information in your company or the confidentiality levels of your different data. Which some, it's something that you would want to have directly on a metadata representation of your data instead of just having it in SOPs or slide decks or policies, right? It's nice to have that directly on the, on the data. You can actually have that and you can automate that with a lot of the different data catalogs. So there's a data governance uh, element there, and that data governance element can also be can also be um, supported by, for example, the lineage function. If you are a data protection officer, and you want to document how data is being processed, a data lineage function is, is super super useful because you can actually see how the data flows uh, downstream and see what, what, what is this data actually used for downstream? How are the reportings, the, re the reports, how, how have they been created, for what purpose, and so on? And is that, is that something that uh, mirrors the consent that we have collected for this kind of data? So mm -hmm. stuff like that, a data governance context. Then there's also, then there are two other contexts, right? And the big, big selling point of a data catalog is actually not data governance, but data analytics or innovation, or whatever you want to call that. But, but the, the most important thing for a data catalog, I would argue, is that you have the opportunity to expose uh, data sources that holds a lot of uh, value, potential value to a lot of users. So if you want to create new solutions if you want to do machine learning, reporting, whatever kind of analytics and activities you want to use, you want to have the best possible data sources to, to do that on, right? And I think it's a paradox that you have described yourself, uh, Joe, sometimes. Maybe also you, Matt, I, have you also described yourself as a recovering uh, data scientist? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're both in recovery. Yeah. And, and yeah, sometimes yeah. recovering academic, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of below that level of recovery. I have been on the like trying to provide the infrastructure and support for um, the data engineers like my entire career. And I've seen, so I, I'm actually in a, I actually like my work a lot. And I, I think I'm at a, at a very good like spot in my career, I really enjoy my work, but but I have been suffering from the lack of attention and funding, like uh, at a big part of my career because I've tried to provide like the infrastructure that makes it possible to do data engineering in the first place, like at that very very basic level of just providing solid inventories, CMDB system inventories, um, and data catalogs. It's a, it's a tough sell, but it's getting better and better because people understand the necessity of these technologies, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I'd say that a big paradox for me is that you have these very highly paid uh, employees, the data scientists, they are normally very well paid. Um, and you have them working on data that you do not, you, can, you have no way of defending if this data is the most important mm -hmm. data, the most interesting data to work on. You simply have no way of knowing that because you do not work on, on, on an evidence-based uh, platform or approach. You, you do not know the data of your company. So you have these very, very highly paid uh, employees who are working on something that might be of interest. It might provide value, but you don't know. 
and you have no way of, of, of making a strategic prioritization of that. And that is where one of the, one of the uh, ways to, to, uh, to change that is, is via the data catalog, because it will allow you to, to examine carefully all the data sources in your company and to choose whatever data, uh, if, if that is of course okay with, with all the procedures in the company, to choose the most important data to work on for analytical use cases. To me, it's just a, it's a giant paradox that we have this big strategic ambitions of being data driven and having these data scientific activities going on with like complex mathematical uh, queries and a lot of, a lot of very intricate, very intelligent stuff. And like the basics, the basics of it often is not, it's not good enough. That's just a giant paradox for me, and it's it's been a paradox all my life. But but happily and luckily, I I can see that <clears throat> that the basics, the fundamentals of this, is getting more and more attention. And so the, the big selling point of a data catalog, I would argue, is here. It's 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 one of those fundamental tools that you need to have in place if you want to do strategic things with data from an analytical perspective. So that's the big concept. And then hopefully, hopefully we'll get to a stage where we can have more end users in data catalog, like everyday end users, I just call them. People that would use a search function in a data catalog to look up a lot of stuff because we simply do not have uh, in companies a central search engine like you do have on the web. Not yet at least, but I, and this is like the future of data catalogs, but we can get back to that. I would argue that data catalogs will, will evolve into some kind of search engine like um, capability in, in companies. But those are the three main, main use cases for, for, for data catalogs. Governance, innovation, data analytics, and, um, and everyday use. Simply looking up stuff like the SOP for cleaning this lab or even like, yeah, looking more into the future, like what's for lunch, uh, who's sitting next to me, stuff like that. It's really interesting. Sorry, Matt, you're going to say something. Oh, I, I was, I was just going to say. I mean, I, I think often as data engineers, when we talk about data catalogs, maybe we do think of them as a bit of a monolith. Like I have a catalog for my warehouse, maybe a handful of other sources. But the way you're <laughs> describing a data catalog, it really cuts across all your data including like source systems, maybe external data sources like SaaS platforms, data warehouse, and unstructured data too. So things like you said, mm -hmm. SOPs, like all kinds of documents are going to be together in the same data catalog. It, that sounds very intriguing. It also sounds very challenging to get everything kind of together in one place. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and that's also why many use cases for data catalogs is not this like enterprise uh enterprise ambition that I that I put forward in my book. And I totally acknowledge that you could use, for example, data catalogs for, yeah, so I have a lot of, I, I wanna actually, I wanna take a moment and, and actually thank my reviewers. I have uh, Jessica Talisman, she's been on your show as a reviewer. I'm very thankful for her comments. Ron Eidelman, uh, also a super nice guy, very, very intelligent. He's also been pushing me a lot on, on the visionary side together with the, uh, Vinu Ganesh, um, he's also been like really insisting on on my more like uh, spacey ideas, uh, if you want. And then I have my actually my my boss, um, head of enterprise architecture, and Ian uh, Storner, uh, Niklas Lagerson. He's also a viewer. He's very much into the technical details and very like very yeah. He's just one of the most amazing enterprise architects I've ever met. And then my old, old uh, PhD uh, advisor, Jack Anderson, and he is, uh, he's like, he's super sharp on all the search engine details, like, like the ideas behind search and what you want to do with it and how you can actually, yeah, use search for strategic purposes. And also like, also just calling my bluff when I say that you can search everything and, and that it'll all be good and say, ah, you know, this ambition, it's so old. We all know it. It can't be done to the level you describe, and so she's getting me safely back to, to planet Earth when I'm traveling in space. Um, 
So yeah, I've been very, very lucky to have these reviewers. I don't think that all authors are gifted with such uh, talented reviewers, and I'm very happy for that. And I also have a lot of people just commenting on the, on the manuscript. Uh, I, yeah, this shouldn't be like a, a big thank you, but I want to I wanna say though that uh, Juan Cicada from Data.World, he has also given us so mm. much, so much input. It's just, it's so rich and I'm very, very thankful. He, uh, he, he has helped me establish what I call the spectrum of search. Maybe we can get back to that detail, but. Well, he always nice. shouts out knowledge too. So shout yeah, out to one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and shout out to no, Jessica too. She was on the show. She's a wonderful uh, uh, guest tonight. I just like the, the the level that Jessica thinks at is, um, um, I like it. She's she just thinks a lot deeper than most people. So it's as simple as yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. So. And and she's just got this very very firm understanding of the concepts in library information science. And and I I was looking for someone that had exactly that profile because I wanted to be. I wanted to be sure that I like when I de when I describe the like the confusion matrix uh, that defines uh, uh, relevance for recall and precision. So this is like <laughs> this is something that I discuss in my book, right? Uh, on the measurement of, of, of relevance of search hits, mm. I wanted to be sure that I had someone looking me, uh, me, uh, over my shoulder, just saying, "Are you sure about this concept?" And, concept and and so so it's been wonderful writing the book actually with all those uh, with all this input it's just been so uh, so great but but i was like i was carried away joe you had a question actually and i i just wanted to to say that with the reviewers but, I, but you had a no, question no, they, I'm sure. well there, there are a bunch of questions we'll get to and i don't know if i have time to get to all the audience questions but i will say you know um writing a book uh the reviewers are that, that that's the secret to making a great book is having the reviewers. Um, we, we had, I would say, uh, you know, sort of the Avengers, uh, the equivalent of that for, for our books, um, you know, review team and, and the bench. And um, so, you know, my suggestion, and if you're going to write a book, I mean, you know, it's great to write a book. It also comes down to your reviewers and in a lot of cases. And then you, you got to look at, at least the way I look at reviewers is, is like um, if you're getting ready for like a boxing match or something like that, you want to have, sparring partners that are going to kind of beat the shit out of you um, exactly. like, and push you yeah. hard. Uh, you don't want people who are going to be just polite and, um, you know, it, basically just not add a, lot, add a lot of value to the conversation. I mean, you want people to push back, right? Cause, cause the real world is going to be a lot harder on you than those reviewers are by a long shot. So it's like, yeah, I mean, that, that's the one thing I would say, if you're going to get reviewers for a book, like make sure these are people that challenge you, um, you know, at, at a very fundamental level. So because the data world is brutal, especially when you get into stuff like um, I, I noticed, like when you, when you get into uh, um, areas like information and um, um, kind of more abstract things, people are super opinionated and engineers are opinionated enough. But then you get into these abstract areas. Um, this is something I noticed. Uh, data modeling is one of them. Right? I just noticed it's just one of the religious areas I've ever seen in my life. Um, everybody's got an opinion on something. Uh, most of the opinions are pretty dumb, in my opinion. Um, but um, you know, it is what it is. People have the knives out for you. So, and, and you better, uh, you know, it is what it is. So anyway, um, <laughs> let's see here. Carl, actually, Evo had a quick question here. And then, and then Sonny had a related question. So we'll get to these. And then we'll talk about the future of the data catalogs, if you don't mind. So uh, Evo wants to know the difference between a data dictionary, a data catalog, and a data glossary. This is just confusing and often used incorrectly. Uh, can you elaborate on data dictionary catalog and glossary? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, yeah, you can you can disagree that on, on that on on several levels even I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> because, uh, because uh, I think that so a data catalog could could have a, a glossary inside it, um, the ontology of your company. But you could also define that ontology outside of your company, the glossary, if you want. Um, but that is something that I think is up to um, it is up to the specific uh, company to decide whether or not these elements should be put together in a in a data catalog, or they should be separated. But I see a glossary as something. I'm a little unsure what Carl means, what the difference between data dictionary and glossary is, because normally when you talk about glossary in a catalog context, 
it's simply a tagging system that can be more or less refined. And I, I am quite opinionated about glossaries, but I, I think that it's uh, so. Carl, if you can, if you can elaborate a little bit about this, or maybe I'm just uh, not responding precisely to your question, but, but a, a glossary, as I see it, is something that you could have inside a data catalog and that is super useful to have inside a data catalog, but that might not necessarily be like the, <clears throat> the, the authoritative glossary or ontology or whatever you have um, of your company. It would just be something to support retrieval and organize, organization and retrieval of, of whatever data assets you would have inside your, your catalog. But it could also be merged and have, you could have like the ontology of your company inside inside the, the data catalog. And that would be, that is something that I think is very, very, um, very useful. Um, I think it's a nice place to put it. I would, I would prefer to have it there, but you would have a lot of other inventories competing with the data catalog to actually, uh, to actually have that uh, glossary of the business uh, inside it. So <clears throat> I'd say a pragmatic approach would be to coordinate your glossaries across metadata repositories. Um, gee, you'll give me a follow up here. Definition of more complex business terms versus only fields tagging uh, in reality. So, yeah, yeah. So, so the way I see that, I guess this is like, um, it, I want to have a conversation with you, Carl. I have seen several posts from your side, so so we should we should chat. But but the way I see uh, this comment is that you can have like. There's this feature in most data catalogs that just says tag, and then you can tag your asset with a tag. And I, 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 I think it's one of the areas where data catalogs should improve a little bit because you would want to have various degrees of controls with your uh, with your glossaries. Speaking about like getting back to hot versus cold data, typically in hot data, you would know the context. And you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't necessarily have like a, a glossary uh, structure that would be very rigid with a very firm central control because it's something that like dissolves over time, whereas cold data that you need to store and keep for 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 like for like many many years, something that would require a a more strictly governed glossary in, your, in order to be retrieved because the context uh, dissolves and then you can't can't understand the context uh, over a long period of time. Hmm. So 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 glossary glossaries need to have uh, various degrees of, uh, of control and authority. Sonny has a kind of a follow-up question. Sorry, Matt, I'm just going to get to this and no, no, okay. just give a quick answer because we got to get to the future data catalogs. But uh, it's, it's related, though. How do you see the link between data catalogs, semantic metadata models, and data models for domains? Um... Uh, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is a tough crowd. Um, <laughs> I, I think, <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. Welcome uh, to the Money Money uh, Data Chat. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, uh, it should change the name to like a uh, hot talks on data. Um, Monday morning interrogations or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> no, I think it's it's only to 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 uh, just. Uh, I want to say this is a great question, and I think so. Data catalogs should definitely uh, take into account um, uh, like data models in general, but data models. Uh, for domains is something that that is used to carry out uh, like it's used to to to, to define and carry out uh, processes inside um, in inside your IT landscape basically. So I'd say that you would want to distinguish the, the way you structure your data catalog uh, from those data models. You would want to represent those data models uh, at various degrees, right? You could see the table uh, structure, for example, of, of tables inside a data catalog. But the overall structure of your data catalog is something that shouldn't one-to-one -one mimic uh, data models that define how uh, processes are carried out in the IT landscape. 
So what I would distinguish very carefully, Sonny, between semantic metadata models and data models uh, as, as something mm -hmm. quite uh, uh, different from each other. Yeah, and semantic data models too, there's some confusion now because, um, you know, products like DBT have their own semantic layer model mm -hmm. thingamajigger. So it's like, we just like to combine a bunch of terms together and call it something new and confuse people. So, but I mean, they're definitely related, though, the idea that you're keeping track of business concepts, then also putting business logic into systems. It just seems yeah. like the integration right now is not quite there yet between those two sides of things. <laughs> it's an opportunity. Speaking of which, an opportunity, Tell which leads to the future. future. What's the future of data catalogs? Yeah, yeah, you're right. We should talk about <laughs> the future of data catalogs as well, given uh, the, the theme here, right? <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm actually writing, like, rewriting again thanks to the the reviewers i was pushed a little bit by uh, by the two reviewers uh, ron idleman and, and the new Dinesh, to actually elaborate a little bit on my vision for data catalogs because i kind of like closed my final chapter with saying yeah i think it'll be the search engine for companies going forward blah 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 and they said well listen, you've described all the pieces to the puzzle, but you haven't like resolved the puzzle. You, you haven't put forward what your vision is. You've just described the components. And so I had to rewrite that on processes of, of finalizing that, that chapter, um, um, or rewriting that chapter actually. And, and so my vision for, for, for the future of data catalogs is that I see the data catalog as something that is a, is a continuation of a very basic human need of trying to organize uh, knowledge so that you can search for it. And this vision has some, it's not something that I see, uh, something that I have put forward. I would be so bold as to di describe my vision as somewhat unoriginal. I think it's very easy to retrieve the visions and also the technology components that mimics or, or leads up to the to the company search engine that I'm thinking about. So consider like the 20th century. In the beginning of the 10, 20th century, we had visions such as, um, I don't know if you know, uh, this Belgian entrepreneur and, and visionary, Paul Le. He had this uh, vision of, a, of a, he called it the Mundaneum. So it was like this big vision of cataloging all the knowledge in the world, keeping it in a in a in an archive that was also powered by like uh, long distance reading technologies that you and you could read all the books at the same time on the screen. You have these like black and white drawings from the 1910s. It's a beautiful vision of something that that resembles somewhat of of an engine, uh, like a search engine. And then you have the Memex vision from Vannevar Bush, how we may think in 1939 and 1945, like leading up to uh, to the Sanadu project and the idea behind like search engines um, and 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 that finally materialized in the in the in the latest part of the 20th century with with the, like with the web and with uh, a little data with the powerful search engines on the web. And so I see a continuation there that we will do the same thing for companies. We will have search engines purely designed for companies. So it will be a continuation of this idea, but strictly for companies. And Matt, you mentioned earlier that this is just a super complex thing to do at an enterprise level, right? And I completely agree. It is, it is very, very uh, difficult. Um, and so, so I'd say in my chapter, I argue two things. First of all, my idea is not original. It's simply a continuation of ideas and desires that we have had at least throughout the 20th century. But then I also argue that it is possible. And I see two reasons for it being possible because the first thing is, ah, this idea, that sounds bizarre. I don't think my idea is bizarre. I actually think it's so unbizarre that it's at the point of being unoriginal. But then the second argument is, okay then, if we take this idea seriously, if you think about the search engine for companies, the engine where you can type in a word and you will get the most precise hit on top of your hit uh, ranking from the entire IT landscape. If we take that idea seriously, then we have an objection. 
And that objection is, that is very, very complicated to do. And that is right. It is very complicated. However, I see two reasons why we can still get to that level. I have two, two arguments that I at least want to put forward. And I think this is the perfect context, actually, because the crowd is so tough. So please, everyone listening, fire back at me so I can, uh, can prepare my arguments even better, right? I still have two weeks to, to shape uh, the, the final chapter. The two reasons is, first of all, it's a competitive parameter for all data catalogs to provide as many out of the box co uh, connectors to your entire IT landscape. So this is a race. It's not something where we can say, oh, we created the connector to, the, to your SAP mo SAP modules, so we're good. Or you, we've created all the connectors to, uh, I don't know, Salesforce. So, so we're good now, we, we can scan everything. Each and every uh, crawler-based data catalog is competing with, with each other to have a maximum of connectors to the rest of the IT landscape. And I know, of course, I know, this is an uphill battle. Creating connectors to an ever-growing uh, ever set of like technologies out there is a very, very difficult task. So, but I think that that is something that will push us towards this company search engine reality. And so the second argument that I have <clears throat> is that, and I think that is my strongest argument, that is that we have during the 2010s seen, like if we get out in the helicopter, we have seen at least three ways um, of doing of, of, of trying to set data free. We have had the data fabric, we have had data mesh, and we also have data, I call it scalable data management, but this book by Pete Heinz Strenghold also defines something that, I think he's defined his, his ideas as, as a data mesh, but I, I'm quite certain that Jean-Marc Degani wouldn't agree. Um, because she relies completely on API technology, right? Whereas uh, Pete Hans Strenghold is a little more pragmatic and also provides uh, uh, RDS and streaming uh, based uh, setups for providing this uh, data infrastructure. But that's not my point. My point is we've seen at least three big theories put out there where you want to separate the data from your operational backbone. You want to get that data out of your operational backbone. The operational backbone is this concept that covers like um, whatever your business is doing is supported by the operational backbone. So you have an ERP system and that ERP system is somehow connected to your CIM system. There's integrations running back and forth and for various purposes. And that is your operational backbone. And in that operational backbone, a lot of data is floating between components, right? That's your domains and your subdomains right there. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we've seen a lot of theories put forward where you want to get all that data out of the operational backbone and into a self-service data platform, ready for consumption out of the box. And I believe that if we extrapolate that, like if we, if we take that tendency and look at it, and try to extrapolate that into the future, seeing what is this consequence? What is the consequence of us freeing all the data from the operational backbone? Then it becomes actually very easy to create a, a search engine for companies because the, every, all you have to do is put a, 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 some kind of technology on top, exposing what is in that data that has been freed from the operational backbone. So that is why I think it is not a wild claim to say that the data catalog or some similar technology, but I think data catalogs are, are, are closest. They will evolve into, into search engines for companies. If, if we take this ambition serious that we want to free data from the, from the operational backbone, then it would be possible to create a, a search engine on top that would, that would make us search all the data in the company that truly would, would enable us to do that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and also some, you know, some things that come to mind is the addition of a, a chat GPT and um, you know, large language models on top of uh, um, this, these data sets. I think, um, you know, the past week with uh, chat GPT and, and similar stuff coming out in the, in the you know, in the public, it's been crazy. The uh, um, types of answers that I'm seeing these, these AI models generate, like they're convincing. Um, some of them are really wrong, but that 
but it, it, it sort of, you know, let your imagination run wild. Cause I mean, the, the biggest, uh, it was at the all in podcast or they're, they're talking about, um, you know, sort of the, uh, use cases of these, um, AI models too. And where it comes back to the conversation here is, you know, a lot of the, um, um, you know, the assets of a company is its data sets, it's private data sets, not its public ones. And so making those more searchable, making those, uh, more contextual as well and more mm-hmm. useful. Um, like, uh, I don't know, it's pretty exciting to see what could happen or, yeah, definitely. And I so I uh, I also want to like I, I want to keep in mind what uh, Juan said earlier about knowledge, right? I I yep. do argue that it's it in my in my final chapter here about uh, about the company search engine. I I do I do insist that we will move from a, a from a technology that focuses on data towards a technology that focuses on knowledge, mm-hmm. because. Um, because data uh, is at a is at a lower level of interpretation. There's nothing. There's no negative yeah. like uh, connotation to lower level, but it's just it's not something that has been interpreted by the, by um, by the human intellect um, <clears throat> and abstracted up to what I would call uh, knowledge. Yep. And so the big purpose of of having this uh, technology going forward is not to expose only the the data inside the right. IT landscape. It's actually to structure like everything that the company knows and and structure that in a way that so that it's searchable. But it should be based on data, but it should be like reflected and refined up until the level of knowledge. So we actually know, so we can see what the company knows, what the entire mass of knowledge in the company is. And that's something that I think it's very important to to insist on i this this gets too detailed but i have some models in in my uh, in my chapter where this is uh where this is uh, apparent yeah joe i saw you oh my dog sorry she's uh oh it's your okay it's lana talking in the background that's what it is yeah um Ole, do you have an opinion about the use of like deep learning technologies and such in this space uh, just like joe said there's a lot of talk about this like deep, uh, I, please enlighten me. What you think of what is deep learning to you? I mean, are you talking about AI and natural language processing technology? Specifically, like Chat GPT, GPT three, like these types of large language models. Uh, no, not really. We're putting you on the spot, so. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, I'm thinking like what I discuss in my book and what I have uh, been like studying for in my spare time for for uh, for the last year or so is is more like closer connected to data catalogs so you would want to like have a, a bit of machine learning and um, a natural language processing powering your search capabilities uh, to, to to provide more relevant hits Outside of that space, I, I haven't, uh, there's a lot of things I haven't followed lately. I, I have to admit because I've just uh, been, been focusing on my book, but I guess, I guess Matt, that you're right. That if I, if I should go more into depth about this vision of the, of the company search engine, it's, it's, it's one chapter in the book, right? But if I should go more into depth, I would have to look in that direction. That's for sure. That's yeah, it sounds intriguing. I know you don't have a lot of time left, so to finish your book, so maybe this will be the next book. We'll be, go deeper on these concepts. <laughs> yeah. I think I think if I said that to my wife, I think I would uh, not have a wife very soon. Uh, <laughs> but you'll have so a great I, book. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, Two great books. Yeah, you're, right, you're right. You're right. Yeah, it would be fun to describe, but I have a lot of good ideas and a lot of good people that uh, that I could. Uh, could do more stuff yeah that's an interesting point though i think that there, there i mean it's something that juan talks about a lot too but there, there there definitely is i would say no shortage of data but the amount of knowledge uh, corresponding to that is um pretty hit and miss and by knowledge um i think that's open to interpretation obviously but um um I mean, in, in a lot of companies, for example, there's a notion of tribal knowledge, right? It's in, in, in no way, shape or form does data that's encapsulated in databases represent um, that knowledge. Because in a lot of cases, the knowledge is just a set of practices that you do um, as a team or as a quote domain. Um, you may have knowledge or data that results from that. Um, 
but um, it's not like this is a automated workflow. Typically it's, these are just ideas that have been passed down from one person to another, typically not documented. And then, um, and how data is used is also, I would say up for interpretation. Like and that's sort of the, I think what you're part of what you're getting at too is data catalogs allow you to find the data. Um, now it's a question of what do you, what do you do with it? And that's, that's a hard one. So. Yeah. I mean, uh, meta models, I think represent like, a, a way to structure the knowledge in your company. And so one of the great things about, for example, knowledge graph based data catalogs is that you can, can play with that meta model. You can, it's flexible and you can define it so that it really mirrors the exact uh, reality that you are surrounded in, in your company. But I, I also put forward in, in my last chapter, I'm a little hesitant to mention it because we're close to like, we do not have that much time, but I think I can get the message through here. I mentioned a model that that is called the DCAR model. So it's called data, information, knowledge, action, result. And it's, hmm. it's one of those model that models that defines how data, uh, when you look at data, um, it, you, can, you can identify it as something that makes us that makes it uh, information once you can identify what that data means, right? And when you think further of that, when you reflect upon um, the information, you obtain knowledge. For example, you can look at certain numbers and say, let's say a sales representative's uh, performance. You can identify that data as being this kind of information. When you look at the numbers, you get a certain idea about, okay, how did the sales representative perform? Then you get the knowledge out of that that knowledge will allow you to um to perform certain actions you could promote or fire the sales representatives perform depending on the performance and that will create create a result right and so i think that is a very it's a very practical way of looking at these layers but but i think it's also very instructive because knowledge is not something um, abstract that we can't really get our hands around. It's actually something that is quite uh, easy to understand in the context of how it derived from data and became knowledge. And I think getting at that level is where you really get a lot of quality out of mm -hmm. uh, of a, a tool such as a metadata, uh, oh, sorry, a, a data catalog. It's a metadata repository for many of such repositories. But but that's where you get a lot of, 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 of benefit from a data catalog. If you can actually, if you can see the kind of knowledge that, um, that, a, that a specific kind of data uh, created and uh, allowed, then, then, then we're talking quality at another level than just seeing yeah. the data itself. Well, as you point out in your book too, I mean, the, the way a lot of people still get data is they just go to the systems and get the data, but there's no metadata there's no context to it so it's just you know go to a table get the data that's it and that's sadly how the world works right now and so yeah yeah what, what about a uh, data catalogs in excel i know we don't have a lot of time but uh, excel is sort of like the dark matter of uh the data world um and i would say this <laughs> uh this is like the one area where it's yeah. uh everywhere you go there, there's 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 there, there's the systems that you want people to use and there's the systems people use and these are often not the same things yeah, yeah. So, I mean, as an enterprise architect, uh, I have years of experience uh, accepting Excel as an application in itself. If people did something uh, wild in a, in a spreadsheet, uh, it it I have to accept it as an application, right? So, 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 Joe, I, I don't know. Are you asking about my personal opinion about that? Because I think that is uh, like getting through without a lot of words, right? But uh, mm. yeah, we'll say that for another day. I, I think it, it's, it's a whole different can of worms in terms of data catalogs. Yeah. I, was, I was asking basically, like the the question was, uh, you know, spreadsheets and data catalogs. But I, I think that that's um, might be a bit more time than we have. So I it's mean, like spreadsheets. It's, it's, and plus, I don't want to gross everybody out either. It's kind of like, you know, it's... it's, it's so. I mean, I if you have a very, very basic need of getting an overview of the data in, the, in uh, the data in your company, you can, of course, register it in, in a spreadsheet as anything else. Yeah. You also have a syntax in a spreadsheet. But I don't think it would be... It, it, it very 
it, it very quickly becomes inefficient, right? As, as with anything in, else in yeah. Excel. Um, so, but you can also, of course, you can you can connect to spreadsheets. Like you can you can you can of course expose spreadsheets and work with them via a data catalog. There's several setups to do that, right? Yeah. And that's more so, what it's talking about that part. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So. You need to be able to do that. It's a pragmatic way. I mean, you want to, I think the final takeaway for, not for the future of data catalogs, but for the present of data catalogs is that you should not expose an ideal depiction of how you think your company should be. Mm. You should use a data catalog to actually expose how you, the data in your company is. That's wonderful. Because that, that's the way you can improve. So don't use a data catalog to to paint an idyllic picture of what you would believe would be the perfect way your company was structured. It is what it is. Use it for what it is. You, you need your data catalog to expose the crap you have, to be honest. If not, you can't improve. That's amazing. I love that piece of advice. It's just super practical. I know, exactly. it's, it's, yeah, so it's realistic. Um, when does your book come out? When's the, uh, yeah. what's the publish date? It's... Um, it's uh, it will be out in April uh, next year. There's also an early release uh, uh, already, uh, so you can read it on the on the Wallet platform. Um, and uh, behind, um, yeah, I was lucky enough that uh, Alation sponsored sponsored my book, so you can read it as an ebook. Uh, just signing up there, but um, but it will be out in April. I look very much forward to it. I look forward to like finalizing. The development editing phase uh, because it is as you know you guys know it's 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 pretty rough and, wait so uh, your your book is you're finishing the uh so your manuscripts do like what did you say december 16th or something yeah yeah that's okay oh oh you might it might actually be out sooner then so when we, we were supposed time. to yeah they're telling us ours is gonna be out in like october or some crazy thing then then we finished it what was it uh may i think was our final then june was when it started yeah, June, July, July, June. Really... yeah yeah exactly. yeah yeah they're pretty fast once they uh get get everything there um like their copy editor for example i don't know if that was just a robot that did that or something but they took the book and it was completely edited in like two days i'm not joking and Whoa. very detailed too um it's a big book though it's 300 pages your book right? four, 400 pages four, yeah. 400 450 pages, yeah I read the whole thing uh, in a weekend. I think. Oh I yeah. So expect to expect to start reading your book over and over again too. I think we had to read our book several times because uh, oh. why not that? Um, <laughs> yeah. So you you, don't, you don't buckle up. It ain't over yet. So, but this is the fun part because you know there's like a, there's an end date, um, yeah. and now uh, you just get to deal with a uh, different set of critics, which is um, your. Uh, uh, copy editor but that's not too bad i mean for the most part we found they're absolutely correct and uh like so uh, that's yeah. the fun part and um yeah excited for you this is gonna be great thank this you. is your, this your first you. book you. it's my first book and i yeah i i left academia thinking okay i will work in industry and uh have fun uh doing that but i just couldn't resist uh, trying to write stuff, and uh, so I finally managed to to, to write a book, and um, it's it's been super super fun. And That's cool. Th yeah, thank you. And I'm and I'm also very curious about the data modeling book that you're, mm. you're writing. For well, I, I might ask you to uh, be one of the reviewers for it, so stay tuned for a, a message on that. So uh, yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah, thank you. So, so, it's 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 that. hard. Um, yeah, not gonna not gonna spill too much of it yet, but I'm, I'm take it. It's called practical data modeling. I'll leave it at that. Okay. So it, it gets rid of like, like like a lot of the uh, um, opinionated fluff out there, and just gets down to stuff that's useful for people who are just need to do their jobs. So um, it, it's gonna. I think it's very similar to uh, uh, fundamentals of data engineering. So yeah, just well, practical advice. Good. Yeah. Thanks. So thanks. no hand wavy BS. Just uh, what do you need to know? So. Um, but yeah, should be fun. Speaking of fundamentals of data engineering, so we did mention in the comments here we're going to be giving away three uh, copies of the ebook here. So uh, Matt and I will go through the comments uh, and be the arbiters of who uh, uh, three people who get that. So you'll be um, messaged on uh, um, LinkedIn, and, and we'll uh, carry it on from there. So um, yeah, and, and uh, next Monday we have uh, Sarah Catanzaro from Amplify Partners. She's a, a general partner um, at Amplify. They're a uh, early stage uh, VC fund um, and she focuses a lot on data. So I think 
uh, so they led like a series A, I think for DBT and a um, bunch of other companies. So, you know, you know what's up. So that'll be a good, good chat. Um, any other events going on, uh, Matt? Anything you're in New York right now? Yeah, um, I'll probably, I'll post on LinkedIn. I'm going to be signing books at uh, the Women in AI Day. I think that's on the 8th, but let me figure out exactly what time that's happening and post it on LinkedIn. Okay, so, there's, uh, what is this, uh, uh, low-key happy hour as well? That's correct. Yeah. So if you if you follow Ethan Aaron on LinkedIn, you should be able to see the post there and just message him about details to RSVP, basically. Yep. So cool. yeah. any events where you are, Willie? Uh not that I know of. Okay, I've been great. living uh, <laughs> in my book cave for the last year and I will get out in two weeks and I will tell you about You it shouldn't you, at this point, dude, I would not recommend going anywhere. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you gotta get the, I'm sure you feel the pressure too. Like you just have to get this thing done. It's I, Oh yes. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, not a lot of things are going on in my life besides writing the book. But it will nah, but, but a lot of things will be happening after it's done. It, it's I, I think uh, your your the way you think about things I think is is amazing. Um, uh, even just reading the first couple of chapters of your book, you know, I was like, okay, he's he obviously uh, gets this you know the subject matter really well. I think you know uh, the cool thing we found about a book is it just opens up a lot of opportunities to. Um, and to chat about your ideas and um, you know get ex more exposed. So I think you'll have a lot of fun. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, and and, and condolences you. in in <laughs> in advance. So <laughs> you're almost done. You're almost across the. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I need that. I need cheering because uh, yeah, it's it's a little tough. I think, but but yeah, you're right. It it op it, it already has opened a lot up a, a lot of uh, doors. Uh, it's it's wonderful. I mean, the, I want to I want to just. One of the final comments here is that I have, I've met so many friendly, brilliant people. And it's just amazing that you can just like, you can just interact with all these clever, clever people uh, that are also very friendly and they give, a, they give some of their time to you. And I've just found that that is, yeah, that's one of the best. I, I thought when, when I was writing the book that one of the best things would be to see yourself on the cover of the book. That would be cool. And, and it is cool. Of course, I don't want to deny that, but it, the, the best thing is that I've met so many wonderful people, mm -hmm. Just truly amazing, intelligent, friendly people. I mean, I knew the world was full of them, but just, I met a lot of people and that's very, very nice. That is awesome. Yeah. That's what we liked about it too. It's uh, and, 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 and the book allows you to, to get access to those people too, because it gives you a reason to talk to them. It gives them a reason to uh, understand what you're about too, which is um, it's different than if you just sent like a random message to somebody like, Hey, you seem like you're pretty smart. Do you want to like chat and stuff? And they're like, no, nah, not really. Awesome. Well, Oli, good luck. Uh, we'll hope to, um, you know, uh, check out your book when it's done, but uh, yeah, congrats already. And I'm um, just, so keep your eye on the prize, man. That's all you can do. So, yeah, yeah. all right. Pre release Thank looks great, so frankly. Like it's a good release. Nice yeah, mm -hmm. very, very good quality, good writing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks to the audience. Great, uh, great comments, great questions. So, uh, we'll, we'll see you all next, uh, next Monday. So, all right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Take care. Thank you.